Uh, my problem here is, what's the good of a bridge if you just get walked over? <laughs> it's also, I commit myself to. It's a bit religious, isn't it? My life is devoted to something higher. Yeah, anyway, which means you're down below. Anyway, yeah, you get the, the metaphor. It goes on. I will endeavor to translate the original message faithfully to satisfy the needs of the end users. What kind of ethics is this? What paradigm? Translate the original message faithfully. Representation. We're familiar with that. That's the equivalence paradigm, right? Remember that one? To satisfy the needs of the end users. What kind of ethics is that? Loyalty. Loyalty, scopos, action. How can these two fit together as parts of the same sentence? The first one, you're looking that way, the original message. The second one, you're looking that way, towards the end user. You could have completely different criteria there. If your end user doesn't need the whole text, what do you do? I mean, it just sounds so good in one sentence, until you start to question it in terms of the kinds of theories and paradigms we've been looking at. Actually, what's happened is the second part of that has been added in recent years. The traditional ethics is representation. The impact of Scopus theory has been such that people are now allowing a slightly wider frame of action. The, the other important, really important thing though, that you tend to forget is that um, it's the original message. Uh, they are suggesting indirectly that it's not wholly ethical to translate a translation. That you should go back to the original. But if any of you came here on Tuesday when Kent Johansson from the European Parliament was talking about how they operate in 23 different languages, you will realize it's impossible to do that if you go back to the original in every case. And it's only possible to do it when you have input from Croatian, not even. Maltese or Estonian into English or French and then from there into the other languages you have this pivot language uh, that's the way it's done be because of simple efficiencies uh, you've become unethical according to this code of ethics a lot of work is done not from the original language but from a pivot uh, uh, language faithful to what? And, and the message. From the perspective of deconstruction and indeterminism, sorry, what, what is this message? It's an act of faith. Yeah. Alright, let's move on. Okay, good. I acknowledge that this level of excellence, I mean, it's got to be real excellence. If you can combine all those things in one performance, you're doing very well. It requires. Mastery of the target language equivalent to that of an educated native speaker. This is interesting. It's changed. Traditionally, it was you have to be a native speaker. Your L1, or your main language, has to be the target language. Okay? Now it's changed because of the demands of so many parts of the world where we don't have enough speakers of English to translate into English. Amazingly so, but that's the way it is. And in any small culture or small language, you'll find many, many translators going out of their main language into English these days. Uh, just through economic necessity. That's recognized there. They do have very good English. That's fine. Why just the target language, though? 
They don't say anything about the source language. Most peculiar. I also point out that one of the long-standing debates in interpreting theory at the United Nations has been the Russians' insistence that the interpreter should work from their main language into their foreign language, L2, L3, or B or C language for you here. Uh, whereas all the other um, booths in the United Nations held the opposite, that you would be uh, interpreting into your main language. Why would Russians have a different code of ethics? Why would they be so different? Can anybody Russian here elucidate? No. No. Russian. It's they don't want to be misunderstood. Exactly. They don't trust anybody else to mis to under to, to understand them. And, and they're going to make sure that that it's that they control the outgoing message. It's, it's mistrust of the other interpreters, I think. But it's also quite legitimate. I, I find occasionally I've had to interpret into my um, B language, which is actually French, believe it or not. And, and I'm quite happy with the result because I, I've got a really, really heavy English accent. Uh, but the person I'm interpreting is an English speaker. So it, for me, it's sort of logic, isn't it? But if you're listening to an English person in French, they should have an English accent. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I've been justifying that for years. <laughs> All right, so it's questionable. You can question. And the Russians have questioned it, and there are very good reasons. I also noticed, I hope interpreters do that, that you do try to interpret out of your second or third language. Because it's so good, it feels so great. Because you've got more time to reformulate. You know, your, your, your understanding, your comprehension is faster, and it opens up space for reformulation. And I, I was convinced I was much better into French than in, into English. Unfortunately, the French receivers didn't agree. <laughs> All right, up-to-date knowledge of subject matter and terminology in both languages. Very peculiar formulation in both languages. But they've only talked about one language. Strange, is it not? Access to information resources and reference materials and knowledge of the tools of my profession. Hmm. Which I found interesting because this is new as well. The technology has come in. Um, it doesn't say you have to be able to use them. You have to know about them. So sort of translation memories, you've got to know it's over there somewhere. Uh, but a lot of, not our generation, your generation should be very good with translation memories, incorporating machine translation at least, but you're aware that the older generations is still a lot of uh, uh, reticence uh, to, to use translation memories. And that sort of recognizes that. Now, okay, um, efforts to improve, broaden, and deepen my skills and knowledge. All right, why not? What's, what's interesting for me in, in that lot is that it assumes that you, as a translator or interpreter, are going to work alone. Now, when I studied medieval translation practices, they would never have had anything like that. Because they were always working in teams. You know, you know Arabic, you know Latin, somebody knows astrology, you get together and sort out the text speaking whatever you can. And teamwork would produce the translation. It wasn't until Etienne Dolé in you know, 16th century France that you get the first code of ethics that says the one person should know both languages. That you get the individual translator in philosophical, religious, uh, or, or literary texts. Prior to that, teamwork was quite normal. What's interesting to me now is that a lot of translating, the volunteer translating, the stuff for Wikipedia, uh, the stuff for Facebook, etc., uh, or if you go to Google Translate a Toolkit, it's built that way so that you can work as a team. You can be translating with other people. 
as it was in the Middle Ages. Unfortunately, the code of ethics has put in this enormous presupposition that you are going to work alone. Perhaps in the future you won't want to work alone, and you won't be able to in any case. Localization projects involve teams. Teamwork is not envisaged in this code of ethics. See, well, I don't get invited to the ATA very often. <laughs> I will be truthful about my qualifications and will not accept any assignment for which I am not fully qualified. Representation. Good. But I tell you, I mean, everybody gets an assignment and, and you don't know about it. And you get very good at, at learning things very quickly. You know, when I was doing my medical conferences, I spent three days reading medical assignments on the topic. And qualified? No way. If I was qualified, I'd be a doctor and I wouldn't have to be an interpreter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so qualified. No, qualified. Ah, I will safeguard the interests of my clients as my own. This is rather Christian and religious. You know, love thy neighbor as thyself, your clients as your own interests, right? and divulge no confidential information. I have nothing ironic or pejorative to say about that. It's absolutely important. And it does happen. It happens in the most unexpected ways, in incredibly important situations, and I can't tell you about them. <laughs> <laughs> but it will happen to you. Okay, just remember, don't. You will be tempted to do something, and, and, and you won't be able to do it. It's just, uh, um, don't do it. No, it's like, many professions have this. It's not just translators and interpreters. Many years ago, I used to do geological work, believe it or not. And the code of ethics is that a geologist cannot hold shares in a mining company. Because, you know, we discover lots of things out there, and we rush to the stock exchange the boss and tell them, you know, buy shit. we could make a fortune, uh, but you will lose very quickly all um, employability as a geologist. Uh, it's a bit like that. You will be tempted to make some money out of the privileged knowledge you get, and you can make some money, but you will lose your profession. Ah, now this is really peculiar. I will notify my clients of any unresolved difficulties. If we cannot resolve a dispute, we will seek arbitration. Now, when I first read that, I figured, you know, if you don't know what this is in the text, go and ask the client. And if you start doing that, you come to the client and you say, hey, you know that translation you gave me last week? Well, I've only got, I've got a few problems. I've got 10 pages of questions on the... You don't do that. Okay, you, you solve as much as you can or ask fellow translators, etc. You don't go to your client with a list of unresolved difficulties. They'll think you're an idiot. You might be an idiot. You've got to maintain trust. The ethics of trustworthiness means that, that you're not going to divulge your, your doubts, your legitimate doubts and uncertainties. It's the nature of language. It means that you have doubts and uncertainties. You're going to resolve them in the kitchen, asking colleagues, uh, asking around. You're not going to go to your client and compromise your trustworthiness by revealing your uncertainty, even though you are uncertain. Okay? And that is ethical, I think. I don't think it's ethical to take a whole lot of unresolved conflict. What they are referring to there, though, are not semantic misunderstandings or doubts about language. There are more doubts about payment. When clients don't pay you enough or on time. Depending on where you are in the world, that is a real problem. Uh, basic things you should learn. I think you learn, you have a course in translation, translating as a professional practice, or interpreting as a professional practice. Big job, get a contract. Get the contract, get it signed. It will protect you later on. 
Figure out how much you're going to get paid and when you're going to get paid and what kind of penalties are, pay, uh, are in place for late payment. Get it signed. Uh, because when they're talking about arbitration, they're talking about that. Get it paid. But that's just business. That's any business. Not only translating and interpreting. <coughs> Got about two minutes left. I think we're going to look at this afterwards. I will use a client as a reference only if I'm prepared to name a person to attest to the quality of my work. I don't, I don't know what that's all about. Okay, you, you want to get a job. In your resume, you list your clients. You tell the clients, I, can I use your name in the resume? And I think that's all they're talking about. So contact the person before you use the name. But that's just straight business and common sense. Do not put in the names of your enemies. I will respect and refrain from interfering with or supplanting any business relationship between my client and my client's client. Do not steal your girlfriend's boyfriend. Or vice versa. It's the same thing, right? Uh, this happens, it happens all the time in business. I don't know about your life, but... <laughs> um, you know, I used to get a lot of work through agencies and, and companies. And um, if you work well, the end client will find out about you. They will often contact you, because it's cheaper for them to come straight to you than to go through the agency, the intermediary. And you are supposed to say to that person, no, I had the work through the agency, through the intermediary. My loyalty is with the intermediary. And do not go off and work for the original client. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Okay. Um, hey, it happens. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, my best clients have got to be like that. But two years later, you know, two years later, they phone you up and say, can you do a, a big job? Well, after two years, no. It, 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 it's, it's, it's a bit relative, but um, if, you, if, you're, if you're working for a company or an agency and they find that you are effectively taking clients away from them, you can be sure that they'll not only strike you out of their lists, but they will tell a lot of other people. And with LinkedIn these days, it's very quick, it's very fast for people to bow, bad mouth you, and you will soon find it hard to get good jobs. Okay, so it's a practical recommendation, I think, that if you do steal clients, you are running risks. Okay, so to summarize, um, in the short text, and you're going to look at this in more detail later, I find some shortcomings. There's only one metaphor for a very diverse profession. I've mentioned teamwork, but you can imagine how does this apply to, to, uh, to um, subtitling, for example, or to medical encounters uh, where people are interpreting uh, uh, about life or death between very different cultures and, uh, and educational levels. You know, can you keep this one code of ethics for that? It assumes a message. It assumes it has this idealistic thing that there is one thing there to understand, and I don't share that assumption. It's not interested, it doesn't contemplate conflict between the various criteria, notably between use and representation. And it's about to express there, but ultimately it, it gives you the profile of the perfect person of what everybody would want, who's doing all these things at once, who has all this knowledge, who is updating the knowledge, uh, in the end we're just human. In the end there's this ideal profile of the complete professional that is unrealizable and will only serve to make us feel inadequate and guilty, as translators and interpreters have always been.